podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree the podcast is brought to you by Soccer90.com, your source for everything FC Dallas and World Cup. Make sure and shop the wide selection of U.S. national team merchandise, jerseys, hats, scarves, much more available right now. Third Degree listeners, that's you. 20% off your order when you use our code Third Degree at checkout at Soccer90.com. Some exclusions apply. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan, and welcome to another episode number... Sorry, Buzz, I I, I just can't read this red crayon anymore. (laughs) It's 189. Thanks, 189. Wow, what a huge number of Third Degree to podcast. Evidently, it's just the uh, the off-season duo. Uh, Peter is... Uh, enjoying Qatar from uh, from Dallas, obviously. We're not rich enough to send them to Qatar. Uh, so you're saying that you need some reading glasses, Dan, to read the format that I put up? I, you know, I mean, in the spirit of this World Cup, I really appreciate you learning Arabic, but yeah, I, I just I can't read it. Yeah, no, <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> oh well, uh, thanks for being here, Dan, and uh, Peter's super busy with the kick around, so. He'll be back eventually, but um, so Dan and I are holding down the fort, and Dan, thank you. Just to mix it up, Dan's going to do the host today, so thanks, Dan. Absolutely. So I guess uh, let's uh, kiss this pig, as you always say, just before you hit the record button. Wait, you did hit the record button, didn't you? Yeah, the red light's on. Okay, good. Otherwise, it'd be a great second uh, <laughs> second attempt. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, World Cup aside, we, uh, I guess let's start. We had uh, it's a little bit of FC Dallas news with the signing of uh, free agent Sebastian Ibiaga from LAFC. Yes, and and I actually looked up the pronunciation and I found it based on um, uh, when he signed with the Dynamo originally. They were very specific, so Ibiaga looks correct. I did see he's mostly referred to as Seb most places I looked, um, you know, by people in terms of what they actually gets called, but uh, Sebastian obviously is his first name. Um, yes. Yeah, thirty-year-old veteran center back, um, physically got some good tools. He has some pace, good size. It looks like, um, you know, clips I've seen of him. He it looks like a solid defender. Um, you know, never has really solidified himself at the MLS level. Has played some in USL pretty successfully in MLS. He's only had one season where he started more than twelve games, and he had one that was a couple years ago when he had eighteen, but. Um, to me, this is a depth piece. Uh, this is not this is a guy that you are okay if he starts some games. If he starts 34, that probably is an issue because uh, he is 30. Um, uh, so for me, this is a guy that's filling the backup role that was provided by Quinones last year and perhaps would have been filled this year by Matt Hedges since it looks like that's what they kind of were wanting him to do. Obviously, since he was on a you know a number in the 200,000s, you know, that's – when he was with LAFC, that's a backup kind of money. Um, so all the signs are is that that's the role. If he ends up having to start over Martinez or Nicosi to Farai, which is where we are right now, that's probably not great. That's probably not what you want out of this guy at the age of 30 coming in from a guy who's so journeyman MLS backup, basically. Um, so much about playing center back is about reading the game and the soccer smarts and that kind of stuff. And while this guy's been productive more usl than mls and does have a good career i don't know that you look at him and go oh yeah that's an upgrade on hedges not not to me that's a downgrade but you're talking about a reserve i think it's okay i think that's one of those uh kind of low risk high reward moves uh you look at you know someone who's made sub 200 um he is went to school in in missouri city texas so he's not going to melt in the sun uh, in the uh, in the summer, his brothers trained with FC Dallas in the past, so you know I'm sure there's some familiarity there too. Um, and, and a guy who you know he was part of the 2021 New York City side, traded yep. to LAFC uh, in August of that year, so didn't didn't get to the point of winning MLS Cup with them, but won MLS Cup with LAFC this year. I mean, he's a you know kind of a obviously. That makes him kind of a proven depth piece. That makes a, a little bit of a statement of intentions that FC Dallas isn't just kind of waiting around. That they're bringing in pieces to go around the core yeah. that can, you know, last year you looked, uh, you know, any time that you went to the bench. I mean, you know, arguably other than centre back because you had uh, you had Tafari, um, who you know you were quietly confident in 
going to the bench often meant oh this this is where it starts getting a little dicey so yeah. uh, adding that sort of experienced player um with a with a track record and it, it sounds like lafc fans are, are gonna miss him that they uh you know felt he was unlucky not to have a larger role in the in the team uh you know, which I mean, that's the the best team in in MLS by a long way. So I'll I'll, I'll take a guy yep. who was just on the fringes of the starting eleven. Yeah, uh, born in Nigeria, but has been here enough. I believe he's a U.S. citizen, based on the googling I could find. Um, it, if this is a backup piece, I absolutely love it. I think it's a fantastic signing. If if this is the this is the guy we're starting, then I'm a little worried, and I think something's gone drastically wrong in their plan. I don't think that's what's happened. I think this is a backup piece. So uh, I'm very excited about it uh, uh, for how it will fit in the team. And apparently he knows um, Nikosi Tafari, at least knows him. It seems to based on what Nikosi put on Instagram or Twitter or whatever that was. We saw him uh, react really positively about um, uh, Ibiaka coming in here. So uh, all good signs. I, I, I like this move. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I can't poke hole in it. And um, he, he was a U.S. under 20, so you got to assume he must have had a citizenship to play. Uh, to play at that level, right, 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 right. Um, so I guess the flip side of that is, uh, well, where does that leave FC Dallas and Matt Hedges? Yeah, the, the Hedges update I had a couple of days ago um, was that Dallas is basically behind the pack. There's a Toronto is the leading club, and then there's a pack of a couple of other teams that are still in it, and Dallas is trailing all of those teams. Um, one of the teams that's right behind Toronto has apparently um, puts forth a deal which may not be quite as much pure money, but might make better financial sense for Matt, what, whatever specific that, that meant. I didn't get those kinds of details other than those two seem to be the two leaders. And then there was a tweet today by a guy who writes for one of the Toronto papers saying that um, Toronto believes that they're like at the line with hedges and trying to push it over. So uh, it sure looks like hedges is going to Toronto. Um, it sure looks like Dallas knows they're not keeping him as a reserve um, by going out and getting Ibiaga, that says to me that, okay, we know we're not getting him. Um, and they're, they're out of the mix on hedges. That's just my reading of the tea leaves on them being out of it on hedges. I know that they probably, if, if hedges all of a sudden came back and said, never mind, I don't want to return, I'm very confident they'd find a way to get him in. But um, I, I think that there's enough teams, I think even the foreign teams are out of the mix now. I think there's enough interest and enough money and enough years on the table for him in major league soccer that he's getting what he wanted. And that's perfectly great for Matt. Um, I don't think that this will close the door on him and FC Dallas as a post playing career thing. I think that relationship remains really good based on the information I'm getting. So this is just one of those end of career deals where a guy's got a chance to get a couple of years of good money from somebody else um, and more power to him. So I think these team, these guys are med hedges and the team are departing on, um, good terms. So if you like Matt Hedges and you like him as captain, uh, you're going to be disappointed, but um, hopefully hopefully they're going to have something better out there. If not, just it's time to go for Nikosi. That, that's possible too. I mean, on the plus side for Matt, uh, if he does go to Toronto, that probably makes him the third youngest player on the roster. Um, <laughs> but I mean, and it's, a big, it's a big thing. It's, you know, it's his last chance at a big contract. Um, you know, as a as a million dollar guy, uh, with you know young kids, um, you know, a, a young family. Period. Uh, you've kind of you've got to do what's right for your family and and make it so that hey, if you go into coaching afterwards, you're, you're not worried about uh, you know what you what you're getting paid. Almost, it's it's just kind of uh, bit of money at that point. Um, so you know, obviously Matt's been a, a great servant for the past ten years to the team. It's it's really good to hear that they haven't done like a Jason Christ kind of. Well, don't let the hit the door hit you on the uh, oh, way out, yeah, yeah. Um, because Matt is the guy. That, I mean, the players will say it. He's going to make a great coach, and it'd be great if he could be that coach in Dallas and kind of settle down back here uh you know if he doesn't want to go up back up towards uh indiana new york uh illinois that way where most of his family is yeah i, I had a conversation with him immediately pre-pandemic uh you know it, he was approaching his 30s at that point and i we talked about you know do you do you have your eyes set on 
what you want to do uh, when you're done playing. Because if you're going to be a coach, you have to begin working on your licenses and stuff. Well, not you have to. You should start working on your licenses and stuff while you're a player. And he and I talked a bit about his desire to be a coach. And that he, he really liked um, lower-aged teenagers. Not kids, like not like nine or eight or nine-year-olds, but not also like 16, 17-year-olds. He likes that sort of 12 to 14 where he felt like he could make – an impact with him, uh, you know, and I remember at the time, the reason I asked him about it was because I saw him going out there, you know, to some of the academy training sessions after in the afternoon um, and sort of lending a hand and helping out. And he said that, yeah, he, he would he liked to go out there and and stick his fingers in and get uh, involved with those kids and, and try and help them out and teach them. And he really enjoyed it. And then, but now, again, that was like four years ago, but I assume that he hasn't changed his mind that much about what he wants to do. And uh, he's a leader and a guy that you want to have around your organization when he's done playing. So hopefully Dallas follows through on that and, and, and keeps that doorway open for him because he'll be a wonderful piece to have to the Academy organization when he's done playing. hundred percent. So the, uh, the, the big question is where does that leave FC Dallas at center back? Boy, um, I, I think uh, you're looking at, uh, if you have to go into this season with Martinez and Nikosi as your two starters uh, and uh, Ibiaga in the mix, that's, Okay, but again, I think you've made a mistake somewhere. I think that um, I think that they need to go out and get one more front line signing. Um, I think they need to upgrade both center back spots. Um, and to me, having Nikosi be a starter, I think, is an upgrade. I think when you, with his physical tools, when you give him enough time, and, and honestly, I felt like they should have started this two years ago more than they did, and you let him play in and develop the wisdom of being a center back, I think he's going to be a really good MLS starter. Uh, he's better physically fit, better able to go 90 minutes, in my opinion, than Martinez is because Martinez has this problem with his legs and he's a little bit older in the tooth and has a drop off as well. So uh, it won't shock me to see them go out and get, I think, a, uh, a free agent center back or a, a, a front line South American center back. You know, maybe we can talk about the free the market that's left. Uh, in a minute, but um, you know, they've solved what, when I did my roster build out, I was talking about wanting five center backs and the need for a veteran backup was going to be either Hedges or now it's going to be Ibiaga. You still want that fifth rookie or young guy, uh, you know, a draft pick, maybe a homegrown college age guy, you know, to be working in as an emergency and developing mostly play for North Texas. You still want that guy, but you want to have four guys that are capable of starting. And right now they have three. So, there's a hole there, and it's a hole that they'll have to address, um, I think, in, in the market. Yeah, I mean, like you say, with uh, Tafara, I think he's kind of proven in his runs of games that he is he's not a guy that you bring in to start one game in a pinch. He's a guy that needs a, a run of half a dozen games to, yeah. to have that kind of consistency about him. Um, yeah, but uh, Martinez is kind of the is definitely the not red flag you know that that injury and or that that condition and that they can't really they can't really say what it is or when it's going to come and affect him it's it's difficult uh you know for for the talent that he has do you want to kind of i feel like if if we were in three subs again you couldn't possibly take that risk with a starting player yeah. To know that you need to leave a sub just in case he has some weird spasm and you know his legs stop moving. Um, it, but it, it'd be nice to not have that kind of load that that on your mind anyway. Uh, and you know if that means getting international spot back as well, that's that's not a horrible thing. Yeah, remember um, that they traded for that extra spot, that extra international spot. And I think you make a very good point that. Um, the, the 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 added sub allows you to let Martinez to be a starter, you know, because you're right. If you if you you couldn't risk that third sub knowing that any minute he could get that hit hit, hit physically hard and be out for the game, and now you're playing short. So it's it's really a luxury to have that fifth sub for him and for this team, because I I agree with you. If they didn't have five subs, this would be a real issue. Uh, it's still kind of an issue, and is the reason why you need another starting center back. Cause as it is right now, say Martinez gets a whack or say Tafari gets hurt and then Ibiaga's in. Well, then who's coming off the bench if Martinez gets whacked or whatever, or if somebody else gets hurt, all of a sudden you're in trouble. 
you know, because whatever draft pick's probably not going to be ready to go. So you definitely need a starting capable center back. And I think you want to go for a big time, legitimate, stable center back. And there are one or two out there in the market, and but you're more likely going to have to go perhaps overseas. We'll see. So, uh, I guess the you know the big first domino to fall we've we've talked about quite a lot is Aaron Long. Alexander Callens is obviously still out there. Hedges are still out there. Uh, is it possible maybe that Hedges is that first domino after all, and then there's a rush for Long, and and everyone else is kind of wait and see. Well, I think that um, even the stuff on Hedges, I don't think any of that really moved until the U.S. got eliminated. And then it was like really quickly, all of a sudden people were like, okay, what are we doing? Um, I think Long is pushing this market higher than we expected. There's some rumors that he might get as high as $2 million Long might because there's there's like five or six teams that are mentioned as being after him. Dallas was mentioned by multiple legit reporters as being one of those teams. I felt they were too. I didn't have any actionable reportable information. I just felt they were. But I don't think they're going to go into $2 million. That's not an FC Dallas price to me. So I think that leaves them out. But it also means that Hedges is more unlucky. He's going to get that million dollars when he's that high. And the the New York guy, Caldez, he's going to – Callen, excuse me. He's going to get that million dollars too. So whether you are willing to pay a million dollars for Callens or not is whether you think I'm ready to go into the market for him or not. He also is 30. You know, he is left-footed. That does perhaps make him a legitimate Martinez – you know, challenger or at least really, really good backup if you're willing to go for a million bucks for him because I think he'll probably get it. Um, you know, I, it's hard to say whether Dallas evaluates him at that level. Compare him, if you will, to Iggy Aba, uh, Aga, excuse me, Iggy Aga, I can get that right. Um, Callens has started 163 of 164 games over his six seasons. So that's, there's no... 12 seasons here, 10 seasons there. So no, this is a front line, every game starter here in, in, in Callen. So, I mean, he was third place in, in defender at year this past year. Yeah. I mean, he is a, he is a top level center back. He can play left back as well, which kind of gives him that, uh, you know, that, that whole Justin Che, uh, chase yeah. the money on two positions. Uh, well, and it, it also would help you. Um, I, I mean, I like him better than Long in a lot of ways because it would yeah. help. Not only does it push Martinez, but it also l- allows you the luxury if Parker's not ready. Um, Nolan Norris, of course, at 17 is not anywhere close to being ready. That's not expected. But you want Parker to be ready soon to start to spell um, Farfan at left back, you know, give Farfan some breaks. Well, what if Parker's not ready? Well, Callens could play there if you need him to. So you could give. Farfan a couple of games off and not having him have to play 34 games again. Cause like he started to wear out at the end of the year, I thought Farfan did. So n- not in terms of like injury, but just like in terms of latent games, he was starting to fade in terms of the amount of work he's oh, getting put he, in. He was, he did pick up a couple of injuries towards the end, just like little knocks, but yeah, you know, you could see the wear and tear on him. And at 23, you want to, you want to kind of keep him, you know, in good condition. You don't want to wear him out immediately. Yeah, for sure. So the the center back market is definitely pricier than I think people often anticipated. Um, certainly than I think I anticipated the value of these guys, the, the value of a known commodity and a guy who may or may not be, um, you know, a domestic player is really high. You know, Dallas already aggressively went out and got another spot. They could go out and get another spot if they need another one. That's not a problem usually for this club who has usually has a lot of Tammy Gamble laying around. So, um, but if it's not, it's, it seems like it's not long, and if it's not Callens, that I would still expect somebody to the, this club to go out and bring in at least some kind of higher grade starter, challenger kind of center back. You're probably having to go outside the country at this point, you know, unless you can get Callens. Um, so that's where the market is, and that's where FC Dallas is. Harry Maguire for five dollars. There you go. Yeah, if you could get Maguire for five dollars, I'm in. <laughs> I, I know, I know that people that like Man U or whatever or England are like they don't like him, whatever. But he would be great here, I would imagine. That's fine. He ain't got to play in the Premier League here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it would be perfectly acceptable. So, uh, I guess uh, you know Matt Hedges two two big roles in the club. He is the uh, you know starting centre back. He is also the team's captain. Um, yeah. Where, where does the armband go? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Well, oh, look, I just looked up the U.S. roster. Collins is not an international, so he's got a green card or U.S. citizenship. Oh. Um, so that's a double bonus for him. Man, get in on Collins. Okay, so captain, that's a good question. Um, I think you can look at the traits that you want a captain. You know, we always said that Hedges was ideal except for his lack of vocality. He doesn't express himself. You know, he's not demonstrative. He's not really talkative. Uh, you want a guy who talks. You want a guy who is a almost guaranteed lock starter. You want a guy who's in step with the coach and the coach's plan, the coach's methodology. You want a guy who's respected by his teammates, uh, usually a little bit more veteran voice, probably. You want Because you want a guy also respected by referees and guys on other teams. So I think there's one great answer and there's a couple of good answers you know even among the younger guys jesus and paxton uh, you know those guys have been captain for a game here and there but i'm talking about the overall whole season kind of captain i think those guys are a little too young still even though paxton is ideal except for maybe he's only 22 so jesus a little more of a loner kind of guy not not a loner like and he don't like people just he's not really gregarious and he doesn't draw people in a, in a fun way. He, he's, he draws you with his ability, but not in his, uh, the way he expresses himself. So the two candidates for me are, um, Sebastian Legette and Paul Areola, I think are the best two candidates. And I think it should be Paul Areola because of the dual language thing, fringe national team thing, knows the coach bought into the system, still in the prime of his career, respected around the league. I think Paul Ariola is the ideal candidate, but I think it could easily be legit as well. It's, it's funny. I remember, um, you know, there was a big emphasis uh, speaking with the players and, and Nico that kind of the, the almost the ambassadors to, uh, to Nico's game were Paul and Paxton. Paxton had only really worked in one or two training camps but you know was was immediately trusted he speaks spanish as well uh you know likewise Paul was you know up until his admission from the world cup had been in pretty much every roster for the previous two or three years uh by an injury um so yeah i i, th I think that's a solid choice uh you know just talking to paul uh after games i think he's definitely one of the you know, you, you definitely get that feeling he's one of the leaders. You talk to other players, they'll they'll soon identify him. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely like that choice. Um, you know, I, I do wonder if maybe uh, keeping it on Jesus, that seemed to kind of, that, that kind of seemed to, uh, to do him fairly well. But at the same time, I'm a little bit of old fashioned in the belief that you don't make a forward a captain, you make someone who's kind of got a good view of the whole game unfolding mm. in front of him, like a, yeah. you know, a center back or a center mid, uh, granted Ariola also doesn't fit that bill, but, uh, you know, he, they play inside out so much that he may as well be a, a center in the mid half the time. Yeah. There is a school of thought of the, um, give the armband to a young up and comer like Jesus to sort of center him and, and, and sort of mature him a little bit. Um, I, I don't know that Jesus needs that. I think he's pretty emotionally mature in a lot of ways. Paxton in, 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 in three years, Paxton's perfect. You know, he's 22 or he'll be 23 in what January or December. Um, he's almost to the right age, but I think he's just a touch too young. Martinez might be a really good choice. Um, you know, isn't, isn't super fluent in English, but does try it, you know, and is willing to do it a little bit. You know, again, a guy that could probably communicate the coach's system, a veteran kind of guy. The only knock against, for me, with the knock against Martinez would be, you know, people, I know he's been here for a year or two, uh, but like around the league, I'm not sure that he's known and respected by referees and players. Probably known-ish, but not like, to me, like Areola is, you know, who's been in the league for a little bit longer and been in the U.S. system for a lot longer and knows everybody. So, um, I still think it's Ariel is the best choice, but uh, we'll see. I, it'll be interesting to see whether um, Nico is a pick or vote kind of guy. It seems like he was a pick guy because he picked, I think he picked hedges, but it's a good question. And I think uh, one to, that people can have fun with since it's not massively important. Yeah. I am. Um, and uh, Paxton turns 23 in 10 days. So happy early birthday, Paxton oh, yeah, Pomico, who's not listening. Yeah. Um, should probably do that. 
Um, Jesus's birthday on Christmas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The Jesus. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, there's also that school of thought of you put the armband on the mouthy little shit mm. uh, because <laughs> that gives them a little bit extra leeway when, you know, not talking their way into the book. Yeah. Um, Paul can definitely be that <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Paxton can definitely be that. Uh, both uh, both lovely guys off the field, but uh, they're competitive players. You cross that white line, and you're a different person. So uh, yeah, you know, there, there's that there's that added uh, edge to to picking over those two. Um, so I guess you mentioned uh, young guys. Uh, MLS Next uh, Flex, no, sorry, MLS Next Fest yeah. is uh, going on in California right now. It's the Generation Adidas Cup qualifiers for the under 15s and 17s. And then, uh, like with all their tournaments, they have showcases for the full age groups. Uh, the uh, the 19s have been impressing quite a bit. Yeah, they actually are undefeated on the season. Um, that's a remarkable achievement. You know, last year, uh, because the 2004s were a very thin class, they had a whole bunch of the guys that are now U19s, the 2005s, like 10 of them came up and played full-time with the 19s. So last year, Dallas was really, really, really young, and they struggled a bit uh, through the course of the season. But now, those the remaining 04s that are left, about five of them, and that core of the 2005s, are, plus all the ones that were still left down, have now all come up, of course. So the 19s this year are really quite talented and have a good de- depth of group, too. So they, they're mixing it up, rotating guys in and out, and they're undefeated on the year. And that's... A uh, remarkable achievement, in my mind, to run through what's up to almost halfway through the season now um, without dropping a game. So shout out to them, and they're playing really well. And, and right now, the guys like Tariq Scott and Nolan Norris are with them some. They don't play every game, but they go down there and play with them You know, half the time maybe. You still see guys like Santiago Ferrer playing there. Diego Hernandez is usually their captain, who I quite like a little bit. You got a couple of guys that have been with the North Texas other than Santiago, like Will Baker has been there. Jared Aguilar has been with North Texas a lot. They've even taken down um, uh, Pablo Torre, who's the striker that for North Texas that was signed out of high school last year. It's from South Texas somewhere. He's been down a little, playing with them a little bit. So they're using a lot of um, guys in and out of there and winning a lot of games. And um, so just shout out to those guys for having a really good season. Uh, so yes, so they they've been playing in the uh, the showcase, two uh, 0 against Golden State, four three Boston Bolts, three one against Bethesda SC, who actually had the uh, pleasure of watching a game with uh, when they did the MLS Next Cup down here. Fifteens uh, and seventeens not done quite as well. Uh, the seventeens uh, they're doing a weird like uh, tournament format for MLS Next. Uh, Sorry, GA Cup qualifying. I don't know if that's to see teams as much as anything, but uh, they lost out in the first round to New York City 2 0, who went on to lose 4 0 to Austin in the next round. Uh, they did win uh, both of their showcase games after that, though. So one of those coming against uh, Miami. Uh, meanwhile, the 15s, uh, theirs is a group format. They lost to New England, lost to LAFC, lost to FC Cincinnati. So uh, tough times there. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, the, um, the 15s and the 17s uh, and the 16s also, but that, I don't think they're involved in that tournament for the GA stuff. Um, those teams have all added a lot of guys. Those are some of the most heavily recruited groups where Dallas went out and added pieces. So there's still probably some integration going on with those groups, but – um, yeah, they're not having quite the seasons that the 19s are, hence the shout outs of the 19s. Yeah, I mean, it looks like the 16s have, have done okay. Um, granted, they've only played one MLS Academy and they did lose that game 3 2 to yeah. uh, LAFC in the showcase, but uh, which in itself is promising. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the league, I guess, more league play goes. Yeah, they started the 16s out, SC Dallas did, with most of the guys from those two groups, the 16s and the 17s, split into their natural age brackets. But over the first month or two, they've started bumping up. The most promising U16s are now bumping up to the 17s. And if you remember, um, before this year, the 17s was all just one group. Those two groups were together all the time. And one of the reasons Dallas added the 16s is because the younger guys often would get left out of the mix 
and you'd end up with all but the very best of them wouldn't get to play. They kind of sit around for a year. So they split that team up, even though they don't get to play a lot of um, other MLS teams in the U16 group, they uh, have able to get a lot of playing times for the guys that are not quite those first high level elite guys that are now moving up to with the 17s. So um, I, I really like that move by the club. I think it's a good, good move and they're still working out all, you know, the bouncing around and all that kind of stuff that they do. You know, Dallas is, they move guys back and forth all the time. So yeah, uh, it looks like, uh, you know, I, I guess in kind of trying to top fill those, those age groups, they didn't send a, a 13s or 14s team this year. Uh, oh, okay. Well, the, the four teams are playing. I, I know those teams are active and out there because I, you know, I, people send me notes on them and stuff. So um, uh, maybe they're maybe they're doing something outside of the showcase. Yeah, so. they could just be not in the showcase. You know, it's. Um, I think the younger kids they tend not to travel them as much. You know, as far they tend to play them a little more locally. But um, it may be why I, I'm not privy to why they do or don't have them at that particular tournament. Yeah, I and mean, we've seen before. Uh, you know, they put they put select teams together from. Uh, a bunch of different teams they'll uh drop out to the showcase and the and the 15 16 year olds from the under 17s will drop back to their natural age groups things like that so uh yeah you know plenty of opportunities for guys to play yeah you can tell a little bit why that's a it's a showcase is a more important tournament because they do tend to put people back to their natural levels um just like they will with things like the Dallas Cup um you know even when next season when the Dallas Cup rolls around when you have guys like Tariq and Norris who will be with FC Dallas a bit, quite a bit, and with North Texas the other part of the time, they'll still send guys like that back. Um, I remember Jesus and Paxton and Brandon Sylvania and Brian Reynolds all playing in Dallas Cup when they were already signed. Um, you know, those big, massive tournaments, the talent is so good that sending those homegrowns down to play with them is better than what they get for North Texas. So um, those bigger tournaments when they roll around, not that – this fast flex fest or whatever it is, isn't good. There are even bigger ones out there like Dallas cup, like the big international tournaments, what they go to, um, you know, in the winners. I mean, and, and normally this is, this is just qualifying for the generation Adidas, which is another one of those chances yeah. to, to play in national teams. Exactly. Yeah. But, uh, you did mention a name that came up this week. Oh, uh, that would be uh, Mr. Brian Reynolds. Yeah, <laughs> that is, the rumor was hysterical. So, uh, <laughs> do you want to you want to play a bit of rumor killer? Yeah, let's do it. Buzzkill. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah buzzkill, huntsman dump, whatever you want to <laughs> call it today. Let's just let's kill some people's hope. Yeah, there's no way. Look, um, Reynolds. Just look at it on his surface. Of uh, when you when when you buy a player for the money that he was bought for. You know, depending on reports, seven, eight, nine million dollars. That means he's getting paid a pretty good amount of money. And in order to get a player like that to come back to Major League Soccer, you got to pay him a big chunk of change. You're talking about probably two or three million dollars for a guy that's still on the books at Roma to come back to Major League Soccer. That's not going to happen. So they're not going to come back to RSL or FC Dallas for that. Now, which are the two clubs that were mentioned. Now, the important thing to understand is that he would, in order for Brian Reynolds to come back because he was sold for more money, he would have to go through the allocation order. So you'd have to look at the allocation order, see who the number one team is, which is probably going to be St. Louis because they're brand new. So if you want to make it a Brian Reynolds the MLS rumor, you got to involve St. Louis in it. You know, are they going to want to spend a couple million dollars on a right back? Probably not. If they're going to use the allocation order, they may be using it on something else. So it's the idea is is silly, and then you conclude on top of that, the uh, how well he's playing by all reports for his current Belgium team. He's playing apparently really well. People are telling me, so I don't think that he's going to be moving, you know, horizontally or back to MLS. The kid's going to be moving up. Is he going to go back to Roma? No, no way. But Roma's going to sell that kid for whatever they can get for him to some bigger league or bigger team than he's currently with now that he's showcasing himself because Roma wants some of their money back, right? If they think Reynolds isn't the guy, they're going to want to get back some of their $7 million. They're not going to let him come back to MLS for nothing. So I would expect that in the next transfer window, based on how he's playing, or maybe next summer, based on how he's playing, someone's going to buy that kid from Roma someone bigger than the club he's at now, but not as big as Roma. Somebody that's in a next step up from that team, whether it's the top end of the Belgian league, whether it's the middle tier of somewhere in England, so, you know, maybe somewhere, uh, another club, a smaller club in Italy. I mean, who knows? Italy's tough because of the foreign rule thing. But, um, you know, the idea that Ron Rose is coming back to MLS, 
is silly. Now, part of that is because when you have a young player and you're an agent and you've taken him over to Europe, you don't want to then two years later turn around and bring him back because then he has this slight stench of European failure on him and you've ruined his dollar value. This is the same thing as the Justin Shea problem. Like people are like, oh, let's bring Justin Shea back. Man, Justin Shea is not going to come back here. His agent would have wanted to come back here. If he flames out at Hoffenheim, they're going to find somewhere else for him in Europe. And they're not going to let him bounce back to MLS with his tail between his legs. Now, we all, and probably the organization, would love to have either one of those guys back, but it, them and their people are just not going to let that happen. You know, the pro progression needs to be upward when you're 20, 21, 22, 23 years old, not backwards. So those kinds of the only the only time you ever see those kinds of deals where you like you sell them and then they loan him back is when the seasons don't line up and you're like we need to stick him somewhere for six months let him finish the season of major league soccer that's the only way those things happen you don't they don't work out other ways than that so you know none of that is actual like i have insider information i'm just telling you everything about how the game works and everyone i talk to about reynolds and shay for that matter that's what they all talk about so I wouldn't hold my breath on either one of them, for that matter. Chase far more likely than Reynolds is, for example. Yeah, you could imagine. You could just couldn't imagine Roma being like, "Yeah, we've got two more. Uh, sorry, three more years of of a contract. We'll just kind of let that fall." And uh, and and uh, Reynolds himself saying, "Hey, you know, I'm being paid however many million. Let me just go back to uh, MLS fallback money." Yeah, uh, you know, it's just just not not a reality at all. No, uh, I did see. Uh, uh, you mentioned actually Toronto with Matt Hedges. I did see uh, the the whole thing about some uh, Toronto fans that were really like convinced that uh, you know I think the SB Nation site up there would be like, "Yep, it's happening." Brian Reynolds to Toronto, you know, because obviously they've got the inside track with every Italian club. Um, but yeah, uh, just just kind of silly. Uh, you know, a twenty-one year old is not going to uh, immediately uh, give up and and go back with his tail between his yeah. legs, especially when he's right now. He's thriving. He's you know, uh, well, thriving within reason. He's yeah. Uh, uh, Westerlo with Griffin Yao. Uh, I mean, he's, you know, there'd just be nothing to gain, uh, especially no. when. At Roma, uh, Rick Cardstorp, who was the guy that was keeping him out of the team, effectively, um, was told that he's played his last game for Roma. You know, there's 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 a, a spot to fight for eventually. He, yeah. you know, he has to grow a little bit, age a little bit, get some more experience behind him. But I mean, he he wants to be a Roma player, and yeah, you know, a couple of shaky games as a 19 year old isn't going to change his long term trajectory. Yeah, when you're talking about a guy who Roma will want to move him, even if they if they if they want to keep him, if they want to invest in him, they're going to want to march him up in the caliber of teams he's on loan to until he's ready for their team. If they don't want him, it's still in terms of getting their money. They want to march him up in the caliber of teams to which he's playing for and showcasing for. And showcasing yourself to the teams that have that kind of money is Europe. It's not coming back to Major League Soccer where they can watch you on TV. You know, it's playing in their backyard where they can send their scout down to watch you every other week. You know, it's the only reason that Toronto even makes the tiniest bit of sense is the amount of money that Toronto will throw down a hole in the ground. They spend obscene amounts of money, but they're not going to do that, I don't think, for Brian Reynolds. That doesn't make any sense. And there's no value. There's the only way that kind of move would happen is if Roma was trying to just get any amount of money back that they could at all, and they considered it a complete and utter failure and a bust, and we have we we don't care, we just want a dollar back, and I I just don't see that. I see that I still see a guy that has potential value to be sold, maybe not for what you had in him, but maybe for close to that, and maybe if you get him moving up the ranks, get him to a Bruges, get him to a, a championship team, get him to a Syria ah just below the big ones you know get him those kind of games with these next the next step up from where he is now and you still got a great player man you still got a guy who's on the cusp of the national team pool you know he's in he's not in the national team but he's in the the top four or five of that position at his really young age with such huge potential 
when you're talking about a guy who could still be maybe a key factor in the Olympic team, perhaps this next coming up, you know, uh, if you want to try and figure out where, where he's a potential fix. I mean, he is only 21 years old, so there's, there's still so much room for him to grow. hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, so, okay. We know, we know that right back is out of the equation. We think, uh, long is out of the equation. Uh, what, what other one other position would you sign for FC Dallas? Well, I think some people might be a little bit surprised, but I think because for me, when I evaluate the Dallas midfield, I see too many players that are the same uh, at one position. Paxton, Pomacall, Brandon Cervania, and uh, Segan Assembling, to me, mm-hmm. are all the same not the same profile, but they're all the same box to box eight midfielder. They have slightly different profiles and slightly different qualities, but they all three play that position. Sebastian Legette is more of a free eight. He's got a little bit of wing in him and a little bit of attacking mid in him. He's got a little more of that kind of bit, you know? So yes, you could move, uh, Alan Velasco into that role if you needed to. Yes. Paxton did it for the first half of the season. But I still think that that doesn't quite fit Paxton. I think Paxton is really, really good as a linking eight. And we've even seen Edwin or Facundo both work as a linking eight if they have to. So there's a lot of bodies at that one style position, and there's not really anybody to play with Sebastian Legette at the more free eight position in my mind. So I think they're set across the front until you get rid of Frank O'Hara and his contract. I think, I think they're set around the, on the front. I think the new young wings have come in and filled those positions as backups. That's great. Other than the center back, which we've already talked about, I think right back is fine between Ema and then maybe Colin Swift or maybe a draft pick or something. I think that's fine. So to me, it's a attacking eight, not a pure 10, but a, 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 a 10 with defensive qualities, a free eight, that kind of position. And I even have a name for you. <laughs> oh, go on, let's hear it. Yeah, I'm going to go with Alan Sonora. I think ah, I think this dude is perfect. He's 24 years old. He's an eight. He doesn't have the numbers that a 10 has. He's not like pure assists and goals guys, but his numbers are closer kind of to Sebastian Legette. He is an American, Alan Sonora, even though he's played his whole career in Argentina, but he's an American. He's buddies with Alan Velasco. He wants to come to Major League Soccer to break into the U.S. national team. Our coach is Nico Estevez. If that gets you a front door opening invite into the national team pool. I think it makes perfect sense. His dad played for SC Dallas back in the day when they were the Dallas burn. So there's a connection to the team already. If, even if Alan Velasco wasn't enough. So not only do I want them to sign an eight. Now remember they do need a center back, but Callens, as we said, was domestic. If that's the guy, if it's not, then maybe you can find another domestic, or maybe you have to go to another international. You know, no, never mind. I'm being dumb. I just said that Alan Sonora is an American. What was I thinking? That, that is so, very true. Yeah, so you don't need an international spot for him. Done, right? Now, is that the guy? I have no idea. But I just think it makes a lot of sense, and that's the kind of player, maybe maybe a touch more offensive than that, if you don't like that, that he doesn't quite have the assists and goals as, as a pure 10 does, but I think he's pretty close to that profile. I think it makes a lot of sense. So that's 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 my position and the guy that I want them to get. He obviously did all right briefly playing in tandem with uh, with Alan Velasco. So yeah. uh, I think you could could trust between them to set up a few goals. Yeah, and we ser- we have a culture here at this club that embraces the South American and the Argentine. We got a couple other Argentines on this team already. You know, I think it makes a lot of sense. Now it, again. I'm not, I'm not telling us that some secret. I'm just saying I think it's a good fit. That's the kind of player that I would like, and it makes sense to me that that would be the guy. Interesting. Interesting. What do you got? What's your position? Ooh. Um, I mean, for me, it's uh, – I know it isn't going to happen without buyout, but I would love a, you know, just a, a steady uh, defensive midfielder, some an everyday defensive midfielder, not kind of – even though it's only two players, right now it's six by committee, which just, I feel, takes a lot of your stability away. Fair. Uh, you know you know that uh, right now, 
Edwin Cerillo, you know, can advance the ball, his, uh, you know, with the ball at his feet, uh, whereas uh, Faku is, is more of a kind of a rangy passer. Uh, I would kind of like, you know, a hybrid of that would be wonderful. A hybrid of their playing styles would be great. A more defensive, yeah, merge uh, the more defensive <laughs> Faku and the more kind of rangy, uh, you know, uh, rangy runner in uh, in Edwin but uh here we are it, you know that that would kind of be the I think the, the dream scenario for me that that kind of you know not naming names to sign but you know every I think every great MLS team has had the Kyle Beckham and the Darlington Nagby type mm, um yeah. uh Jimmy Char uh, sorry uh not not Yumi Chara, uh, Diego Chara type, you know the guy who can just kind Chow of sit, Paolo the, in Seattle, yeah, yeah, the yeah. destroyer who you know every every play is kind of started by Chris Armis. If you're old school, in the loss. All right, I'm not that old. Yeah, you know I am. I throw it out there for the old school listeners. Yeah, I other than the fact that 800 K and Faku sitting on the bench would be, Oof. I mean he's already doing that, but having three deep would be, man, that's a lot of coins. So I'm I'm with you like. Um, you know, it, if you could buy him out and not have to use his buyout on 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 Frank O'Hara because you can just wait till the summer, or if that other team to, that was apparently interested in Frank O'Hara were to come in and actually buy him, I don't see that happening. But I suppose it's possible because they won't want to eat his contract. But um, I think it's more likely you're stuck with Frank out of the summer. But um, you know, I, if if that were the plan to move out Falco and get a guy of that caliber at six, yeah, man, I, I jokingly tweeted during the World Cup that. Um, if, if you're talking about aging mid 30 year old players coming to MLS, give me Busquets. I mean, that's the guy to me is a dream, right? Maybe not at his age, but you know, if you could have got him at 30, Oh man, what a player that would have been. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think he's 34 or 35 now, but still, you know, I a hundred percent buy your idea. Uh, it's just the money on Faku that makes me think you probably can't do it, but if they could, I would love that just as much as I would. I mean, there's listen with Sonora being, domestic you know in my little move i suggested and if you can get Callens again also domestic still got that international spot floating around maybe they could buy out for canoe and get a guy there's no no reason to say they can't the window doesn't open until february for mls so remember windows are about incoming players it's the mls incoming window in mid-february that matters so we got we got a month and a half you know before we need to really start watching those uh, deals to actually happen. But we're, we're in the window where we should start to see r r ripples in the waters where things are being, you know, thought of and tested and worked out. So yeah. um, I like your shout. It's a good one. You know, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, anyone that's kind of looking for some MLS content, the league did put up a uh, top 10 uh, free agents right now. Uh, Jonathan Segal did it. Obviously mentioned Alexander Callens, uh, uh, long and and hedges um but a couple more uh you know there's uh you know uh Jonathan Osorio who is a fantastic player um just coming off the uh the world cup uh, for Canada who's a free agent uh you know kind of a, a good playmaker you've got Jassy Zardes who's popped up everywhere lately uh, you know, not not my favorite striker by any means, but uh, you know o Ola Kamara as well as as a forward. Um, you know, last season he made a million and a half, but at thirty three, you know, if you could get someone like him for for cheap, who would basically be what you wanted out of Frank O'Hara, but with actual results potentially, uh, <laughs> or you know, the inevitable Kai Kamara gets uh, traded again, and and everyone's like, why hasn't FC Dallas ever gone for him? Um, you know, uh, there's there's some interesting uh, there's some interesting little uh, play GM yeah. moments there. I like Osario, but he was on a million last year. That's uh, that's tough, um, especially because you know Sebastian Legette is probably in that same neighborhood. I, with the extension on Legette, they probably lowered that number down and extended. Would be my guess. Um, that number has not been reported yet. We'll find out. But uh, that's why I like the younger, sort of early twenties kind of guy. And instead of the 30 year old guy, because two 30 year olds there doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but um, I do like him as a player. Um, I, I think on Frank O'Hara, I, I think you just let his deal run out uh, and then he'll go to one of these clubs in Argentina or whatever that are interested in him. I, I doubt those clubs could afford to A, pay any kind of fee to get him out of here 
or B, afford to match the salary that he's making here. So I think you're stuck on Hara waiting until the summer. And then you'll see them go, depending on how good Jose Milato looks or Camungo looks if he plays at the nine. Camungo's, Camungo for me is mostly a wing, but he can nine. So depending on how those two guys are doing, filling in some, maybe then midsummer you can go out and get a, a, a guy. Not saying you get Kamara. I'm just saying a guy of that vintage, a 30-year-old journeyman yeah. backup to back up Jesus. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, we're talking about uh, MLS free agents. They are going to be older yeah. players to have served that time to make them eligible for free agency, um, you know, and more than likely in those cases going to be expensive guys that teams, you know, turned down their option and made it through the, uh, the uh, whatever the pickup draft is. Um, because people draft. Didn't, uh, yeah, that's one. Yeah. Uh, the waiver drafts, yeah, because uh, nobody wanted to pick up their uh, their options. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be great to – I mean, especially, uh, feel, you know, quick plug for the, the Discord. That's always a fun place for Patreons mm-hmm. to uh, engage in some discussion and, and uh, you know, some fantasy GM moments always, uh, always make for some great conversation in there. Speaking of which, did you see the interesting tweet where – um, about Ima Tomasi right back that Francis Satu and they went at somebody on Twitter about stop saying there's a problem at SC Dallas at right back. The stats don't lie. Yeah, um, yeah. A certain, a certain uh, blog in the, in the uh, FC Dallas scope. Uh, yeah. Yeah, put that in a headline. Uh, you know, let's be honest. It, you know, would you like to upgrade right back? Yes. Is, up, is right back what's holding FC Dallas back from not challenging not really. No, yeah, I, I agree. I think Ima Tomasi is a perfectly serviceable outside back. You know, and, and as the as uh, Francis hinted, the numbers are are fine. You know, it, uh, could progress be made? Yes. Can he do some things that Brian Reynolds and Reggie Cannon could do each in their own different ways? No. But I think that there's room to grow for um, Ima still. You know, he, he when he was with in the USL, he was really good about um, um, chances created, really good about setting guys up. And, and for me, I think he spent most of this year, you know, trying to solidify his defense. Yeah. And so next year, my goal for him would be to, OK, try and bring in some of that creativity that you had when you were a winger in college and you were a winger playing in USL. Try and, you know, break some guys down and get some chances created for yourself. Now, Nico doesn't run a system with super adventurous outside backs. They play a little bit more of a support underneath, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't still do some things there. Um, So I think there's a little potential to grow with him. You know, I don't, I don't look at him as a guy who's, you know, completely capped out in terms of his potential yet. So, uh, but again, not a position where when he's on 350 and doing decent things, that was part of what I hated about the Nanu signing last year. It's like, why, why are you spending 650 to, uh, on a position that's just fine. It's not great, but it's fine. You know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, if yeah. if uh, if Colin Smith's not ready, then yes, go out and draft a right back or go get another guy that's a, in the same sort of tier as Ima, you know, that 250, 350, like uh, Farfane is on the other side, frankly, you know, that's of that same defensive caliber and let those guys go head to head with legit competition with each other and that'll improve both of them. You know, so there's some things you can do to make that position be better than it was. Nothing is ever not have room for improvement, but I I'm, I don't see that as a um to, in my mind as a position that's like a problem by any means. Not compared to some of the other ones that I think are are problems still. No, for, for sure. Um, anyhow, we I'm pretty sure we said this would be like a a quick thirty minute job, and we've uh, as always just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> talked a little bit more than anticipated uh yeah. so i guess uh you know is is there anything kind of else any any last uh orders of business for you no i think that was it i think we got over everything i was surprised we came up with as you said with as much stuff to talk about as uh we did so good Absolutely. stuff dan thank you no thank you uh the only only one thing i i have um you know if you're scratching around for live soccer because it's an experience not a tv show um Saturday at, uh, at Texas Women's University, six o'clock, four o three sixty, and defeat as kicks. Uh, play in the UPSL North Texas final. 
uh, that always promises to be a fun and bloody game. Uh, so I am debating whether I'm going to that one myself. Uh, it would be cool to hear of uh, anyone else going. Yeah, and both the Psychics and the Outlaws have started their season. So uh, if you like the indoor game, again, those are fun or in person. Go out there and have a good time at the indoor games. Those are both completely different venues and a totally different game day experience. I recommend both of them on different reasons. Uh, The Outlaws was a really eye-opener when I went to one of their games. uh, So I would recommend both of them to check it out. Yeah, I had the the Outlaws... One two one. What what's for that? What's for that outdoor ninety minute? <laughs> I know, scoring? right? Yeah, I don't know. I, that may not be a good sign. Actually, that they only they only scored two goals, but I guess it was a good defensive game. I mean, tattoos their coach. I mean, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, that is very true, and it sounds like uh, yeah, the sidekicks are kind of getting back to well, really, what what you wanted to see out of them after a, a tough free, uh, tough few years. Uh, their yep. home opener comes up also on on Saturday at the Credit Union of Texas Event Center at 10 p.m. So, uh, yay soccer. Sport local soccer. Absolutely. All right. Well, th- thank you, Buzz. Thanks for keeping everything on track and keeping us informed, as always. And thanks for taking a turn hosting. No, my, my, yeah. no, just never ask me to do it again. It's been a uh, <laughs> been a mess. So come back, Peter, please. But, please. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, it's Buzz. Just stopping in here to remind you that Third Degree, the podcast, is brought to you by Soccer 90. Our partners are your source for everything FC Dallas and World Cup. They got everything U.S. national team, jerseys, hats, scarves, all the good stuff. As a Third Degree listener, yes, you, 20% off when you order with the code Third Degree at checkout at Soccer90.com. 3-R-D-D-E-G-R-E-E, just like the website. Some exclusions may apply. Anyhow, uh, please uh, subscribe on the Patreon. Uh, buy, no, no, I guess the t-shirt shops now. now. Uh, follow on social media, all that fun stuff. Join in the Discord. It's always fun there. And uh, I guess we'll maybe come back next week with another episode of Third Degree the Podcast. Alan, come to Dallas. Yes, thank you. Ooh, woof! Third degree, the third degree net pocket. Third degree, the third degree net pocket. Third degree, third degree net pocket. Third degree, third degree net pocket. Twenty five, twenty five long hard years, yeah. Was carry, yeah, the man. man. 25 years, you better be giving this man at least five dollars a month. Patreon third degree, come on, pay the man. It's the only comprehensive coverage of my fucking club that I love so much. Hey, come on, it's third degree or bust. Yes, give the man some other f- money. Hey, third degree, third degree, never care.